Edgar Middlehauser's My Bones and My Flute, Introducing Caribbean Literature. I hope you've enjoyed reading this novel. This book is one of the most important novels to reimagine the ghost story under the auspices of Amerindian traditions. While this may not be obvious upon finishing the book, I hope, you, I hope by the end of this presentation you can start to see how Middlehauser has infused Amerindian culture throughout the book to reinvent the prototypical ghost story. Although there are writers before Middlehauser, I've decided to start our course with him because he was extremely popular across the pond. He also represents the evolution of Caribbean writers who begin their careers writing in and about the Caribbean and then have to immigrate to England, France, Spain, and or to the United States to support their writing careers. Middlehauser's career in particular moves beyond the Caribbean where he writes about his British problems in his life and with his identity. He still focuses on the Caribbean in a lot of his fiction, but it holds a, an exotic place in his more salacious, salacious fiction. Now, Bones of My Flute is believed to have been written while he was still living and working in Guyana. In a lot of ways, the novel fits into traditions of modernism, and perhaps postmodernism. Middlehauser uses stream of consciousness and tension felt through the suspense in the novel and the belief and disbelief of the ghost among the various characters. Middlehauser's ghost, which is always off the page and spotted through dreams and visions, reimagines the specter in Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. Middlehauser's narrator, Milton Woodsley, functions as the reader's interloper between the fantastic details of the story and the reality of the world. Like Joseph Conrad's Charles Marlowe in Heart of Darkness, Woodsley re recounts how the entire events transpired even when they seem ridiculous or impossible. He presents, quote, the horror of the horror, end quote, of the journey for the reader to get a panorama of this experience. Unlike those two earlier books, both certainly texts Middlehauser would have been aware of from his British-based education, My Bones and My Flute adds an extra layer of complexity through the introductory notes and the postscript of the book. More than a prologue or epilogue, these paratextual chapters throw into question the authenticity and reliability of Woodsley. Indeed, try to remember that his name also evokes another giant of English literature, John Milton, a famed Paradise Lost. However, R. Milton is of the woods, dark, otherworldly, and living in a lost paradise that has been taken away by colonialism. The map on the left, picture one, is Guyana now. The novel starts off in New Amsterdam before the characters travel up the Berbice River to an old plantation home. The characters then travel in the jungle. You can see the capital of Guyana, Georgetown, indicated with the star. The map also shows the infamous settlement of Jonestown, not an actual city which is indicated by the mapmaker's use of italics and the brown dot. Jonestown, a place where most of the world first learned about Guyana, was the resettlement of a 1970s American cult led by Jim Jones. He made his followers drink cyanide laced Kool-Aid at gunpoint before he took his own life. 909 Americans died in this event in July 1978. Jonestown is also subject of a novel by Guyana writer Wilson Harris entitled Jonestown. The map on the left, picture two, marks Guyana's current world fame as home to many spectacular waterfalls. Its rainforest, climate, and varying topography make it an ideal place for waterfalls. I borrow this map and its information to show the linguistic diversity within Guyana. However, this linguistic variety belies the colonial expansion and settlements by Europeans. For instance, the Babis Creole Dutch spoken, now nearly extinct, indicated on the map, 
represents the Dutch plantations that used to own and control and exploit that area. That area is approximately the setting of our novel. Most historical slash anthropological theories also maintain that the majority of surviving Caribs and Arawaks from Columbus's discovery migrated to the interior of the South American jungles. You can see how these ideas are verified by the large linguistic concentrations of Amerindian languages still alive in Guyana. According to the novel, the slave uprising killed Menhir Vorman's family and leaves a curse on people to force them to reunite him with his family while receiving a proper burial. Wesley's postscript debunks th this curse. Middlehauser's use of this event provides a powerful clue to a possible theme for the novel. In a few words, he is arguing that the past has never really left the people of Guyana. It almost possesses the present and haunts the people of Guyana. The Slave Rebellion of 1763 involved 4,000 slaves and took the colony, quote, more than a year to recover, end quote, according to Carrie Car Gibson in her history, Empire's Crossroads. As a point of comparison, South Carolina's most infamous slave rebellion, the Stono Rebellion, or Cato's Rebellion, in 1739, only involved 40 slaves. Haiti's slave revolt, which eventually drove the French out of Haiti, and became known as the Haitian Revolution, started with 100,000 slaves in 1791. The quote on the left signifies Middlehauser's trust in Amerindian beliefs with the power of nature. When European pe people or colonized peoples raised as Europeans encounter nature, they may find themselves in opposition to the natural world. However, natives to an area understand the power and beauty of nature around them and try to restore harmony. Nature in this vein forecasts disasters and ghosts in this case. Middlehauser also uses a frog in its chirrup can be heard right outside, right before the apparition appears. Middlehauser also suggests at times that the characters are going back in time, or confusing time, especially when regarding Western notions and devices of time. Clocks and watches tend to break or stop in the novel. At one point, Milton thinks that the sunset has already occurred. He notes, quote, So vividly did I envision that it might have been happening. I seem to have the notion that I've been rejecting my being through time was sitting now on the front stairs, watching the river and the sunset. On the silent air came the voice of one of the laborers in a snatch of song, and the song to me seemed to become one with my reflection on the illusion of having traveled ahead an hour or two in time. End quote. Here, time gets changed from present to the future to the past. The interior promotes timelessness. The novel's ending perhaps owes itself to this, this device. Another important element in the novel is the constant reference to spiders. Spiders in Amerindian literature are trickster figures, much like Br'er Rabbit in African American literature. A Nancy or a Nancy, the spider, is often referred to in the Caribbean literature. Middlehauser purposely makes reference to the constant presence of spiders throughout the book, to cast shadows in the scenes, and to make the characters question their reality. Again, this device gives priority to nature over humans. Please watch the video on the left to discover the history of Anansi through Gerald Mondorman's picture book, Anansi the Spider. Please use these sources as resources for any papers for the course. Proper MLA documentation has been used as well to provide a model for citing sources.